On today's 159th episode of The Thriller Zone, I am thrilled to kick off Rising Star Month, where for the next four weeks, I'll welcome a handful of authors I feel are genuine rising stars in the thriller genre. Today, it's my honor to welcome former fighter pilot and current debut author, Jack Stewart. Jack's one of those men who has always gone the extra step, both in his education, his military training, and fatherhood, and now in writing. And as you'll quickly see, Jack's one of those authors who, in this podcast host's opinion, has everything it takes to be one of the greats. Join me in welcoming debut author and someone I'm happy to call friend, Jack Stewart. How cool is it that we finally get to sit down in my own home? I know. That you flew in for just to be on the Thriller Zone podcast. I did. I mean, it doesn't hurt that you live in beautiful, sunny San Diego and... (laughs) <laughs> you know, you have a wonderful home that you invited me into, so I'm very fortunate that you invited me. Well, Glad we got to make it happen. Absolutely. Folks, in case you're wondering, yeah, unknown writer is what we're talking about today. And because I'm uh, that guy, I have a paperback, and as my other camera will show, a hardback, because I'm part of the Jack Stewart fan club. <laughs> um, I also have a little plane, and I have the... Uh, this your swag kit, by the way, that came in the mail. That's pretty Tony. Glad you liked that it. That is very nice. Now I do want to know a couple things. Yes. And this is just the green room warm up, right? Yeah. The red tag. Yes. That says remove remove bef- before flight. Yep. I have seen that somewhere. That's an official, actual. That, that's that lives somewhere. Is it on the on the air on the exit doors? It's on anything on an airplane that um, should not be on there when it's flying. So, you know, it could be covering a pitot tube or um, it could be on the propeller, on the intakes, uh, anywhere. If you have something protecting the airplane while it's on the ground, you Uh need to remove it. It has a tag that says remove before flight because we're, you know, dumb pilots. We need to have the reminders. (laughs) So, yeah. My second favorite, well, that's, that's not my first favorite thing is first thing I want to ask my favorite thing is the lanyard because it has a built-in bottle opener (laughs) now I I found that (laughs) humorous because it's seems oxymoronic if you're wearing a lanyard which I would think for work and yet you have a bottle opener explain that to me yeah you know uh, I I just like to go right from uh, work to play and very seamless transition so you know, when I come home, I don't like to take my lanyard off. I just like to pop open a beer oh. and just sit down. So, yeah, I mean, I figured pilots would appreciate it. Sure. If you're not a pilot, then you can at least appreciate being a pilot. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we have so much to talk about. Um, I mean, about Colt Bancroft, about who's just a, a killer, cool character. The the series that's being developed, uh, I, I will admit that I do have access to the sequel which i've already started which we'll talk about just a little bit we'll refer to it because i know i want to have you back when that one comes out i want to say february of next year yeah uh, yeah, february 20th right now um is when it's going to be released so we're going to save that juice for there um i was telling (laughs) jack over lunch just a few minutes ago that it's funny that tammy and i were watching Top two two movies we just watched this past week, completely coincidental. Top Gun's Maverick with Tom Cruise, and we were reminiscing about how fun that movie was. And then, of course, Flight with Denzel Washington, which has a different kind of a turn to it. <laughs> yeah. But one thing we mentioned at lunch: Did every teenage or slightly older than teenage guy, when they saw Top Gun, didn't they all want to run out and become? A fighter pilot. I mean, I think they did. I mean, at least that's what happened to me. But and I do know that the Navy had a huge, you know, recruiting, you know, surge after Top Gun came out. And of course, every single one of them wanted to be an F-14 Tomcat pilot. Um, And ironically, they were kind of hoping the same thing would happen with Top Gun Maverick. And in fact, it did. A lot of people did try to join the Navy to be uh, fighter pilots. But there was such a backlog in the training pipeline that they couldn't take anybody so it was like of course you know we wait however many years we waited for top gun maverick to come out for the sequel to come out yeah couldn't even take them 40 years yeah it's 86 to almost yeah like 30 30 some years yeah yeah. 
It's crazy. And you know, just as a side note, testament to Tom Cruise, talking about a guy who has aged well, yeah, and a pr- prolific career. But um, the F fourteen in itself. Did I hear while we're going to geek out on Top Gun Maverick a little bit? Did I hear that a lot of that? Uh, footage was actual footage there was not a lot of green screen cgi stuff right for the f-14 like the f-14 is the one you know that they they uh i don't spoiler alert for anyone that hasn't seen top gun maverick that the, they steal and to get back to the ship yes i think that was all cgi that f-14 footage was all cgi okay the f-18 the super hornet footage through the rest of the movie was all real footage i mean they the the actors were actually sitting in the back seat of a Super Hornet, pulling G's and doing all those maneuvers. So the actors actually had to go through enough training to be able to withstand that kind of force. Yeah, yeah, they did. Which is, could you explain that to me? Because <laughs> yeah. I've I've watched this in movies throughout the years, and I'm like, and I've been in enough. I did the aerobatics uh, flights in Chicago at some kind of a festival, right? And mm-hmm. so you'd hit a little bit of a G. You're like, whoa. Yeah. But what you guys experience is vastly different. It's, I mean, I'd say most aerobatic planes actually pull more Gs than you would pull in, a, you know, in an F-18. Uh, but in an F-18, you're also wearing a bunch of gear. You're yeah. wearing your helmet, you know, it, the mask. It's a completely different environment. But... Um, the training they put us through in in flight school to be ready for that is called a centrifuge. Uh-huh. We we like to call it the spin and puke, um, and it, you basically sit in a capsule and it's on the end of this long arm and it spins around a room really fast and so you pull in centrifugal force, you know, and that's how you're you're getting the g forces on your on your body, and um, they always video it so you get to go back and look at yourself and watch, you know, you go from look look like a 23 year old man to all of a sudden look like you're 60. Um, no offense because you look fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's pretty uh, pretty eye watering experience. Um, and they teach you how to combat those G forces. And, yeah. And the they call it the anti G straining maneuver where you're tightening all your leg muscles, um, your your buttocks, and 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 really kind of bearing down to keep that blood up into your head. They teach you all that stuff, how to breathe. And uh, yeah, so I'm sure the I'm sure the actors all went through that same training. Let's go back to an early moment when you very first got into the program. Let's do that because I have a chance to sit down to talk to somebody who's been there and done that, and I may never have this chance again. So, take me back to those very first days. What what did it feel like? What was going through your mind? What were you most scared of? What were you most anticipating? Wow. Um. That's, I mean, it's, and I know it's been a while. Yeah, it's, it is, it has been a while. I, I do know that, um, each phase of flight training, you know, you, you sort of just when you get a grasp on something, they move you to something else that's more advanced. And so you, you're constantly feeling like you're just one step behind where you need to be. Yeah. And I think that's by design. And the Navy, and I'm sure the Air Force does it the same way. It's very methodical, it's a crawl, walk, run mentality. But, you never really feel comfortable in each phase as you move along. And so you almost don't have time to worry about, you know, what's coming up. But I, I'll say that the biggest thing that most jet pilots, at least in the Navy, their biggest concern is landing at the aircraft carrier for the first time. I mean, sure. that's just like, I got to land a jet on a boat in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. I mean, that's so foreign. It's yeah. unlike anything anybody's ever done, you know. The, what's the thing called that hooks it and what's the thing that calls it catches it uh when you're landing yeah yeah so you uh, have a tail hook attached to your jet and it, it catches we call it a resting gear a resting cable um that's stretched across it's just this big braided steel cable across the flight deck but you're going from how fast to how slow how how quickly yeah like I mean, 150 miles an hour to zero in just a couple seconds yeah okay yeah it's 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 pretty, it's pretty eye opening. And in order to do it correctly, they, they say you have to put the tail hook into a three foot diameter circle. So, you know, you're moving the, the boat's moving, uh, yeah. the jet's moving, and then you have to aim, you know, to put it in that three foot diameter circle. And so it's the, the, the margins are so tight when you're doing it. So yeah, it's, it's nerve wracking, but then it becomes fun after a while. Yeah. You know? 
daytime at least daytime well i was gonna say and if you <laughs> if you're approaching and you know that you are clearly outside the perimeter you just circle take off and circle back right yeah you don't i mean as the pilot you don't do anything you keep going all the way until the lso's oh. uh, the, they're called landing signal officers that are on the um, edge of the flight deck standing there looking at your jet they'll tell you to go around they, they do what's called a you know wave off yeah um and there's lights that you'll see flash that tell you go around in which case you just add power um you don't pull the nose back you just add power and so if if you add power and it's too late and you still come down and and land i mean that's that could happen yeah if you pull the nose back you could be dropping the hook oh. and, and grabbing a wire while you're still flying and then the jet slams down oh, and yeah. breaks so that's not it's called an in, in-flight engagement um and that that's not a good thing yeah. <laughs> and um and so yeah so you don't do anything until the lso's tell you to go to you know wave off go around thank you for bearing with me on some of that because yeah. those these are questions that i've always wondered and you know you never get a chance to be up close to a guy who's actually done it so i think the thing that has always grabbed my attention in both top gun and maverick was how fast you have to decide something I think to myself, oh, when I was doing radio and morning shows, oh, you got to make decisions really quickly. Yeah. You have to make life-altering de decisions in the flicker of a second. Yeah, that's one of the things that we talk about a lot. When we do an air-to-air -air engagement, it's not uncommon to have a 1,000 knots of closure. So if you think that's how you know my airspeed plus his airspeed pointing nose-to-nose, -nose, that distance gets eaten up really quick. And uh, we used to joke that we go... Um, to the ship drivers up on the bridge of the carrier and they they would be freaking out about some ship that's you know 20 miles away and we're like we're doing like 10 knots you know <laughs> like you, you have hours to decide what to do right. and uh yeah our decisions have to be so much quicker um but that's just again something they train you to and you just eventually get there how often does this ever happen where you have, like, and you see this in Maverick, you're flying this way and one guy comes in upside down. Does that ever really happen? People have done it. Yeah, people have done it. People have done it and run into other uh, jets. Um, I have friends that have had that happen, um, which is not a good thing. No. Um, yeah, we always used to joke that if you hear somebody say, you know, hey, watch this, you know, you got to be careful. Yeah. Um, there's no real reason to do like they did it in, you know, in Maverick, but yeah. it makes for a really good cinematic shot. That phrase right there, no real reason to do it, usually always ends up in a Hollywood movie. Yeah, of okay. There's does. no yeah. real reason to do this, but it sounds crazy. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. As we start making our way toward Unknown Writer, the, you know, many writers have the talent to create. Uh, people and situations out of thin air, right? But what has always set things apart for me is when people have actually lived it. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm reading this book and I'm knowing, because I've known you for about a year plus now and I've followed you on social media and I've, you know, I've drilled down on a few things and I know that you've actually lived it, then it gives you a whole new appreciation. And I remember one of my very first writing classes, write what you know. Yeah. Now we can, we could spend an hour on write what you know, versus write what you want to grow to know. And I'm not going to bore anybody with that, but that sense of authenticity cannot be duplicated. Yes. I know that I can read about uh, a Tomcat fighter and I know I can talk about velocity and speed and this, that, and the other. But until you can actually, like I was telling Tammy, my wife, I was telling her that Jack would describe something with such a tiny little, like the way you would look over your shoulder to see something coming. It's yeah. the tiny little details that make me go, you can't duplicate that. Yeah. Unless you've been in. Would you, yeah. would you agree with that? I would. And I'm, I, you know, I always appreciate reading books or, you know, watching movies where I um, really feel like I'm part of the action, you know, like where I can just close my eyes and just feel like I'm there. Yeah. And I wanted to give, you know, the reader that experience when it comes to naval aviation in particular, because um, like you said, there's not a lot of people that get to experience that. And, you know, for me growing up, uh, Flight of the Intruder was like, my Bible for what naval aviation was, you know, Stephen Koontz was such a huge influence when it came to writing about that world. 
but then he quickly graduated to other, you know, aspects of fiction. And, um, I really just wanted to give the modern day reader an opportunity to read something where they can feel like they're a fighter pilot, you yeah. know, give them that kind of, I mean, I think it's a pretty cool career. I really enjoyed my time doing it and, and you know, I'd like other people to experience it. Well, and that therein lies part of the equation is that you allow me to live that experience yeah. as though, and I, and I, this is one thing that I want to really impress my listeners about is the way that you took me inside that world. And this is not talking about, and you've heard me say this on the show, I don't need to know, and I'm not going to, I'm going to massacre this. I don't need to know that he picked up a fill in the blank rifle with a certain, certain kind of grain and the optics on this. That is interesting. I'm not, I'm not belittling that at all. I mean, uh, let's, let's, I'm thinking of Jack Carr, for instance, Mm -hmm. Jack Carr is a gun fanatic and knives and all that stuff. That's great. It's fabulous. Me personally, I don't necessarily, I mean, you can pick up a knife and stab the guy. So sometimes that authenticity uh, uh, requires that detail. Sometimes it doesn't. Either way, the fact that you pulled me into that experience is fascinating. Now, I'm going to jump back again, and then I'm going to come back forward. But I wanted to know how far back, because I always think about this. Oh, I've wa- I wanted to be in radio since I mm-hmm. was in, in junior high school. How far back did you want to be a, a Top Gun fighter pilot? Can you remember how yeah. far back? Yeah, 1986 when Top Gun came out. I mean, oh. that was, you know, I mean, I'd always been fascinated by aviation. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a pilot for fun, so I'd been flying with him. Uh, my, my mom's dad was a B-17 pilot in World War II, so I, I was always fascinated with World War II aviation in particular, both on the Army Air Corps side and on the Navy side. Um, I remember, uh, gosh, I don't remember what, how old I was, but my dad picked me up from school and we drove to Reno for the Reno Air Races and I got to meet Pappy Boeington, you know, just famous uh, Marine ace. They had the show, you know, uh, Black Sheep Squadron. Yes. And uh, I got to meet the Japanese. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. I got to meet the Japanese fighter pilot who shot him down. Wow. Um, and it was just, you know, aviation was in my blood, uh, and I always gravitated gravitated towards the military side of it. But I really, you know, didn't know whether I was going to go in the Air Force or Navy or whatever. But the minute I saw Top Gun, I was like, "That's what I want to do." You know, not only does it look cool, but it <laughs> looks fun. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's that was kind of my goal from that point on. It looked cool and it looked fun. Right. How much of the cool met the expectation <laughs> and how much of the fun? You know, we always <laughs> joke that um, telling people you're a fighter pilot doesn't necessarily get the reaction that you think it's going to, you know, when you're 10 years old. Um, yeah, I, I uh, distinctly remember um, going out in, uh, in Reno with some squadron mates and um, girls would come up and ask, you know, what do you do for a living? And my friend would say, I'm a stevedore. And they'd be like, well, what's that? Well, it's kind of like a longshoreman. And they'd, they'd go, oh, okay. And then later on he'd say, you know, they, they usually don't know what that means either, but they they feel too stupid to ask again. Right. And so that was uh, that was the common joke. We just tell people we were something else other than a fighter pilot because, uh, yeah, it didn't really get the reaction that it, you you hoped for. Yeah. But in our, our minds, we were pretty cool, you yeah. know. And did everyone – uh, slather up tan lotion and and get on the beach and do yeah. volleyball and wear aviator sunglasses. No, unfortunately. <laughs> but but when you uh, when you start flight training, you go to Pensacola first. What's called API uh-huh. aviation pre flight, and that's where they issue you your flight suit and your boots and your leather jacket. Ooh. And I went through API in the middle of the summertime. So Pensacola, July, August, Ooh. it's hot, right? Yeah. And um, I can't tell you the number of times I saw people driving on the freeway on their motorcycles with their leather jacket on. And I'm like, man, you you just got that, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's do a little bit of history here. Graduated U.S. Naval Academy, serving 23 years of fired pilot. Flew combat missions, three different aircraft carriers. Graduate of U.S. Navy Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun. Master of Science in Global Leadership, right down the road. How much of that global leadership education do you use today? Um, so that degree in particular was, it was uh, primarily a project management degree. And so 
Um, it was focused on international business and project management. And so I did get a project management certificate. I uh, got a project management professional. Um, I got hired as a project manager for a marine engineering company, actually, when I left active duty. Um, and I thought when I quit that I would never use it again until I started writing books and realized I got to figure out how all these different plot lines like line up and when they're going to come together. And um, I actually break out my project management software uh, sometimes when I'm kind of stuck on how to weave plot lines together. So it came in handy, actually. I'm so glad that you uh, mentioned that particular turn because I want to get to my accolades. I don't, even over lunch, just over an hour ago, I did not say, I, 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 I said that I enjoyed it, but I, I want to drill down one extra line because here's why I loved it. It is truly nonstop action with engaging characters and a hell of a plot that made me go, please, for the love of God, do not end. And I'm trying to think, especially with the volume that I read, how many times do I say, please do not end? And when I got to that ending, which I did not see coming, I went, this guy's a writer. Well, thank you. Thank now, you I knew, well, I knew you were a writer up front. And then, of course, I'm studying development and, and character, and I'm watching how does the first third go to the second third? Will he hold me in the second third? But, dude, I, I mean, you don't, you don't break any punches, and you keep that momentum going nearly... I'm going to massacre the number. What's Mach, Mach 1? Is that pretty? Yeah, Mach 1.8 is the uh, the top limit for the F-18. So we'll just go with that. Okay, so yeah. Mach 1.8. <laughs> and you keep it that way right up to the end. And then that ending is startling. I literally stopped. At the, I turned that last page because Tammy was getting ready to go somewhere. And I said, hang on one second, babe. I got one more page. And I turned the page and I went, what? So I'm like, now I can only imagine what's going to happen in Outlaw. And now I got a pretty good idea. So there you go. That's what I, I love this Thank book. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to write you a blurb. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> You're going to have to. I mean, with that kind of praise, how can I not use it? Well, and, you know, there are people on the show that, that share likenesses to authors that have gone before. Mm -hmm. And I think I saw, now I've got, I've got two versions. I've got paper and... All right. You, I mean, look at this. Look at the advanced praise on the back of this book, folks. And I'm going to put some of this up on the count uh, on the screen. We got Jack Carr, Simon Gervais, Brad Taylor, Connor Sullivan, David McCloskey, Taylor Moore, Don Bentley, Ward Larson, all of whom have been on the show. They know what they're talking yeah. about. They're great writers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the one on the front cover that, that I think means the most to me for several reasons. But yeah. Mark uh, Graney. Mark Graney. Yeah. And that's my point. When he says strongly evocative of classic Clancy because before I even read that because I had the arc there was no quotes and when I finished this I said to Tammy this feels like Clancy man I mean this is rock solid Clancy and then you sent this in the mail in my little swag attack and I'm like holy bananas there it is yeah and Mark knows a little something about writing <laughs> yeah I, I know that's why when he said that I was uh, completely blown away because you know I mean Clancy's my hero um, I grew up on him and sure you know I just I love every to this day the books that come out you know like my book came out the same day that Mark Cameron's last Clancy book came out and I think I was like a little kid waiting for the Amazon delivery to you know like yes it's my launch day but I want the new Clancy book you know so isn't um, that a cool feeling it's a really cool feeling yeah Mark Cameron's a hell of a writer too. oh he I? is he is something else I love the fact that we have these authors who have gone before, who crafted some of the most engaging, suspenseful, riveting, educational thrillers of our generation mm -hmm. that only beget more of the same talent. Yeah. Um, and to find these authors, these most of these authors, and I'm including you in this, most of these authors don't write Oh, you know, they're kind of Clancy-esque. No, you're you're as close to Clancy as if he were writing it himself. And I would love, wouldn't you love to sit down with him and go, Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, 
Mr. Clancy, what do you think about this? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I really would. I mean, um, he was one of those that I think passed a little too, you know, a little too early for most of us. But fortunately, you know, Mark Greeny was able to pick up and, and carry the torch. And so many great authors after have done that. And they've, they've, I know a lot of people have um, maybe criticized the, the whole estate, you know, writing and stuff. But if you're a fan of that world that that author created, you don't want it to end. Just like you're saying, you don't want a good book to end, right? Right. I I don't want it to end. Like, I want to keep reading about Jack Ryan and all those characters. So, And I can understand that they're going to be the naysayers who go, oh, you're in it for the money. You know, the, the legacy writer or the, the, leg the families are just generating for this mm -hmm. money. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Everybody's got to make a living. But the fact that you can carry on that feeling yeah. and that tone. Do you, I mean, I think about Vince Flynn. Vince yeah. Flynn, talking about, talking about somebody going way too soon. Yeah, absolutely. And yet, how many writers do we know personally have carried that torch and are doing yeah. nearly as equally as good, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, Kyle's done a fantastic job and you know, I can't wait to see what Don does with the series too. Don's gonna nail it. He is, he is gonna nail it. Here's a little Easter egg. Did you find this um, in the book? I mentioned Don in there. Did you notice? Uh, I cannot say that I. <laughs> it was did. very. It was a very very subtle reference um, to Don because you know he's been a, a a good friend and you know a good mentor to right. me as well. So I threw a little Easter egg in there. So you know I'll just, I won't say what it is. I'll okay. let some some readers uh, find that one. But okay, it was pretty fun. I will happily play ignorant just in case. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say this. Do, do you recall, I'm not going to be the guy who says, you know, where do authors come up with their ideas, mm -hmm. but do you recall that first moment? This is really more specific. Do you recall when you went, I got this idea for a book? Yeah. Uh, for this one in particular, I do. Um, I, re I read an article. Uh, it was online. Um, I can't remember the website. Uh, I want to say The Drive, maybe. But there was an article about a Navy destroyer off the coast of California that was being harassed by some lights off the coast, and they just didn't, you know, didn't know what it was. And so the article had pictures of the ship's log, talked about what the captain did, what the crew did, couldn't find the source of these lights. They were just swirling the ship, and the FBI got involved. They traced it maybe to a sailboat, and they investigated and of course, the the premise of the article is that there was UFOs, right? Right. And I was like, "That's pretty fascinating." I mean, I've seen some stuff while I've been flying, and um, it could be UFOs. But what if it wasn't? And so that's kind of what got me thinking: What if it wasn't UFOs? Why would these lights be circling a Navy ship? So I, I wrote the opening um, chapters of Unknown Writer, and um, didn't really know where it was going to go. I didn't have a well thought out plot or anything. Um, and, uh, that's probably why my agent had me rewrite it a few times, um, before I finally found the full story, but I just knew where it was going to start. You know, I want, it was a mystery I wanted to solve. There, there was a number of times and I'm not going to go back and pull them out. I do have a couple of little, uh, sticky notes, a couple of times that I asked myself, would it be possible for such and such to happen? Is everything in here for the most part, and I'm not talking about yeah. really obtuse things, but for the most part, is everything that you said doable? Like there's a few secretive thing, a few code things. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, I would say um, if it's not uh, possible, I'd say it's plausible. There you go. I mean, there are some, there are some things like, um, without giving too much away on the, on the story, I talk about a technology that um, was criticized back in 2017, even about possibly having weaknesses that could be, um, that could be, um, you know, hacked into by our adversaries. And, um, and so I'm not the first author to talk about this, you know, the, the JSF having these kind of weaknesses because it's so technologically advanced um, and we see, I mean, every, every listener, you know, has had, um, phishing emails or, you know, um, texts that are probably somebody trying to get your bank account information. Or, right. You know, I mean, our adversaries are getting smarter and, um, you know, an American trader, Brad Taylor talks about, you know, uh, this type of thing. Um, and, uh, what was it? 2034, 
four. Um, it was uh, Admiral Stavridis, who was one of my uh, strike group commanders. Um, he uh, he wrote a book, um, and it talks about the same type of thing. So um, while I don't know that it's possible, it's plausible. And uh, yeah. Well, there are several things that happen in this book. Several. And again, I don't want to ruin it because it's it's riveting. But you go, is that possible? And if it is, holy bananas. Yeah. Um, the jamming frequencies, mm -hmm. the ability to commandeer a particular type of machinery mm -hmm. uh, is spooky. But here's a couple. There's a couple things I want to. The very first note I made. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm but. There's this particular scene, oh, and so-and-so is coming up on so-and-so, and oh, it looks kind of dangerous, and she's being kind of coy, and he's being kind of, oh, maybe she's interested in me. But it's the way that you read, I'm going to read this. Yeah. Her velvety words elicited such desire and passion that he missed the sensation of cold steel against his neck. That's a great sentence right there. When the icy tendrils across his trachea erupted in burning agony, his eyes shot open and stared into the black void of the woman leaning over him. <laughs> I won't read the rest because it's uh, <laughs> rather adult, but dude, that right there, I yeah. mean, I circled it and I highlighted it. And I'm like, that, that is. Yeah, that's, uh, that. I'd say that particular scene is one where I, I receive the most text messages from people and saying, I just read this. Yeah. Uh, you've got issues. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I don't know how you are as a writer, but for me, um, I really kind of let the characters do what feels natural to them. Sure. Uh, when I started writing that scene, I didn't expect for that character to do that thing and it just fit. So I left it and, um, it's, I think it, it's, uh, very appropriate for yeah. who that person is. I don't want to name drop, but I'm going to name drop because Patricia Cornwell was on the show recently and she is someone that I was, have been working about a year to get on the show. And, um, she said a similar thing. She goes, I've always wanted Kay Scarpetta, her main uh, protagonist to tell me where she's going. Mm -hmm. And when people who are not writers like my wife, who will hear me say, Oh, I had a particular car, uh, character named Carter I'm like I'm just waiting for Carter to tell me what he's going to do yep. and she would look at me like what I'm like no we without sounding woo woo we we channel a uh, character of some sort in our imagination and that's one of my favorite things about writing yeah. and you can't say oh I'm going to do this because sometimes when you release the yep. better magic comes out yeah have yeah. you ever tried to explain that to anyone? Uh, I, I haven't tried explaining it to anybody because I don't think that anybody can, you know, understand it other than another writer. Yeah. Um, but I, I do know that um, one of my favorite authors it was a fantasy author, Terry Goodkind. Hmm. And um, I, I read all his books religiously. And, and in the beginning of one of his books, he dedicated it to the main characters. And he basically said, thank you for letting me tell your story. And that stuck with me. Like, like even thinking about it now, I get chills, yeah. right? Because that's how intimately as a reader, I felt connected to them. And to know that the author felt the same way, you know, it really, it, it really goes from being words on a page to like a window into someone's life. Yeah. And, um, and I think you have to release that to really have, like you said, the true magic kind of take place. Yeah. And some people don't, I don't know if they don't, understand it don't appreciate it they want to figure out how to create that secret sauce but you, you know there are a lot of people say oh good writing can be taught others will say you either have the talent or you don't i don't know exactly where i sit on that fence but i would probably tend to say that much like a pilot you probably have a natural propensity to think fast on your feet you probably have superb eye-hand coordination. You probably are really adept at making substantial decisions quickly. I would say that is probably true of you in general. Yeah. So now compound the fact that you have a passion to fly yeah. and then go from there uh, leads me to believe that, well, you have a, you have a natural acuity for that. 
Yeah, but having a natural acuity for it doesn't mean you can do it. I mean, I had to spend, you know, almost three years learning how to fly up to the F-18, you know, because there's training. And so if somebody wants to be a writer, um, I think the, the only thing that you need to have is an active imagination, you know, and then everything else you practice, you learn, you get better. So like put the words down on the page. They could be full of grammatical mistakes. You could be making every kind of error. You know, my English teachers would probably cringe at half the stuff I wrote, um, you know, even probably now. Um, but the more you do it, the better you get. You know, like you, you don't you don't fly an F-18 on day one. Right. Just because you have this natural, you know, tendency. Sure. Right. You have to be trained. And so I think writers need to be trained, too. And you do that by practicing. Well, what was one of the first things I said to you over lunch? I said, I could see a difference. And I can't, I don't know that I always see this. I could see a difference between book one and book two. And I don't know what that time elapse was. I'm going to imagine it's a year or so, uh, if not more. But I could see the difference, the shift. Mm -hmm. uh, could be very subtle. but And I couldn't tell you exactly, oh, David, well, what is it he learned? Um <laughs> I don't know what I learned. <laughs> you, you could see the difference, though. Yeah. So back to your point. Yeah. Uh, I've written now nine books. I told you over lunch. My by my tenth one, I want to go out and see if I can. I've got what it takes, right? But I knew that it would take enough practice yeah. to go. Do I have the chops? Yeah. So kudos to you. I do want to know this because uh, I'm really curious. John Talbot. Yes. Is your agent? Yes. Super nice guy. I met him at 2019 Thriller Fest. And I just remember he, I think he and his sister were together uh, on that particular time. And I remember him being one of the few guys that just sat down, really engages, mm -hmm. really listens to you. Mm -hmm. He isn't like, uh huh, yeah, what? No, yeah. I want to know A, how did you land him? And B, how has that experience been? Yeah. Um, so the way I uh, found John, um, you know, like everybody, I was, you know, just trudging through the trenches of querying. Yeah. Um, I, I think I was querying my uh, fifth book. Um, so again, like you were saying, you had yeah. to write and write. And every single time I wrote one, I thought, this is it. This is the winner. Right. And I got a bunch of rejections or a bunch of silence. And uh, But I kept trying, you mm -hmm. know, kept learning. And um, so it was my fifth book. And it was um, it was a book called Pony Up. And it w it took place in Africa. And it was kind of about, a, a you know, a little bit of a special operations aviation blend and um, queried a bunch of people. And um, I saw that John was going to be at Killer Nashville. Um, and he was one, he was like my dream agent. Like if I could get John Talbot to be my agent, I would be thrilled. Wow. And they were offering, if you paid a fee, I don't remember what it was, you could send John um, your first chapter and then sit down with him for 30 minutes and he would critique it for you and give you feedback. And so, you know, I'm nervous in my suit and tie and everything. And I'm <laughs> just waiting for him. And he called, you know, I go in and um, I remember he pulls it out, looks at it and he goes, oh, I really like this. This was really good. And then he set it aside and we started talking about my background, talking about being a pilot. And and uh, he was more interested in that. Um, and then eventually kind of uh, the our time was near, nearing the end. And he said, um yeah, I really like it, but, um, you know, no one wants to read about Africa right now. Like, cause there, Yellowstone was the big thing on TV. Sure. And Taylor Moore just has this great series that takes place in Texas and yeah. we're uh, just coming out of COVID and it's like people, you know, aren't thinking globally anymore. They're thinking locally. And right. so he really wanted something that took place in the United States. And he's like, can you, can you write it so that it takes place in the U S and I was like, man, the whole thing's about hunting Al Shabaab terrorists. I don't think you can do that in the U S <laughs> but I'll try. Yeah. So uh, he's like, yeah, send me the full and then, you know, I'll get back to you. So I sent him the full manuscript and uh, six months later, another agent who had asked for the full manuscript offered me representation. And um, I, I told her that I had another agent that was looking at it and I needed <coughs> a week to get an answer. So I went back to John and I, I said, um, are you still interested? And he said, yeah, uh, but not with that one. I want to see how else you've grown. Send me something else you've written. And so I sent him one that I had finished that was all domestic. And he's like, yeah, that one was terrible. Not that one. And then I sent him like two chapters of unknown writer. I just started writing it. And he said, but this one, this is going to be your first book. 
uh, when can you have it done? And this was in January of 2022. And um, I said, uh, March. And he goes, okay, talk to you later. <laughs> and, uh, and did you have it done in March? I did. I had it done in March. Um, and he, uh, he had me rewrite it. Um, the first rewrite, you know, he called to give me his notes on it. And, uh, you know, he, he used to be an editor. And so he, he's got a very editorial mindset. And, and, um, and he's very smart about this because he was telling me all these good things about it. And, and, and then he's giving me his feedback and I'm sitting here tallying it up in my head. And I'm going, so John, this sounds about an 80% rewrite. And he goes, yeah, that sounds about right. I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, I need another three months, you know? So I went back to the drawing board and, um, um, got closer on the next, you know, version. Um, and I think part of it was I was hearing things that he liked and I was trying to incorporate those things in. It wasn't really being true to the story, right? That's what oh, we were talking about. Like, yeah. You have to let the story kind of go where it's supposed to go. And so the second one, um, a little bit better. But in back of my head as I'm writing, I know that my fighter pilot buddies are going to be reading these books. And I know they're going to critique every little thing in them. And so I was being very like, oh, that would never happen. you know. And, and i making everything very realistic. And, um, John gave me some feedback on that next, uh, revision that, that I still think about to this day when I write, he says, you're writing for an audience of 200. We want you to write for an audience of 200,000. Oh. And, uh, I was like, that's really good. So he's, he's thinking bigger, you know, make it bigger, make the bad guy badder, you know, like, like more Hollywood, right? More, right. uh, more, more stuff. And so I went back to the drawing board and, um, uh, came out with, you know, with what unknown writer became and was very, very happy with it. Uh, I sent it to him and he said, you did it, you nailed it. Um, and then, you know, then there was just some, from some fine tuning that needed to take place once I, you know, sold it. But, um, but he's been fantastic to work with. Um, you know, I think, um, I value his opinion. I, you know, I, I call him, I text him constantly, you know, Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know? And, uh, he's, he's been great. I think people, this is just my opinion, that they see agents as either being, you know, that wise old man on the hill mm -hmm. and he will dispense the wisdom that he sees fit. And others see him like more like a relationship, yeah, not, not yeah. quite like a drinking buddy, but somebody says, look, I know what the market needs. Yep. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I mean, I, 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 Bless you. I honestly didn't know what to expect. Like, I didn't know what that relationship was going to be like. Um, no one ever really prepares you for how do you work with an agent? How do you work with the editor once you're at a publisher? No one really, there's a lot of books on how to get an agent. There's a lot of books on how to break into the business um, or the craft of writing, but the actual business side of it, no one really tells you that. So, you, um, so, so my relationship with John has, has been, um, very um candid conversations and a lot of times he's telling me things i don't want to hear like the market isn't right for an espionage novel the market's not right for this kind of novel um and i know a lot of uh, other uh, authors struggle with that sometimes like you know hey i really want to tell this type of story but if they're not buying it then they're not going to get published oh that's what you mean when you say the market's not right so he has a finger on the pulse of what the market is wanting right now yeah the market in terms of what uh, publishers are buying you know i think uh, i think the readers you know i think the readership is there probably for those kinds of books but maybe the publishing uh, market like the publishers may not be buying those might not be acquiring those types of stories at that time and I'm, it's a pendulum. I'm sure it's going to swing. Sure. You know, I mean, if you think back, you know, during the Cold War, um, Clancy and all those types of techno thrillers, that was all the rage um, in the you know late 80s and 90s. Um, and then now we're seeing a little bit different. And a lot of it's based on what's going on in the world today. And um, and so I think there it'll it'll shift. Yeah. You know, it'll shift. Yeah. Do you? Um did he say at any time anything like, here's your secret sauce. Here's the thing that sets you apart. Here's what I see in you, Jack, that I think people are going to really be drawn to. 
I mean, I think the authenticity of when you, when I talk about aviation yeah. and, you know, that's, that's what sets me apart. You know, I mean, I've heard several people say, um, you know, readers are always looking for the same, but different, <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone, everyone's heard that advice. And, um, and so I'm trying to give them a story that is the same in terms of like nonstop action, mm -hmm. um, you know, engaging characters, whatever, but different. Um, Nasmov is set in the cockpit of a fighter jet and, um, which was for me, uh, is the big challenge because it, it, you know, I flew single seat fighters for my entire career in the Navy. I'm the only person in that cockpit. I can't have tension by myself, right? right. There has to be some external things. <laughs> and so how do I convey that in a book? And that's, that's been the challenge. Um, but I, I fortunately, I think I pulled it off in, the, in this one and. Uh, I think it pulled off an outlaw too. <laughs> yeah, you did. You know, because we we all know how not only how tough this business is, but how it takes so many people to make it happen. Who would you say? And we share some mutual friends in the business, but who would you say? And maybe it could be the top three mm -hmm. people as we get to start wrapping this up that have been most influential. The one to three people that went. I've got a piece of advice or information that I hope you'll listen to, yeah. or I'm going to, I'm going to lead you by example. Don't do the, make the mistakes I made. Um, first and foremost, Mark Graney, um, you know, he was, um, uh, so let me back up when I finished my very first book. Um, I, um, I had read Ward Larson's Perfect Assassin and you know he he's a Southwest pilot like me and so I I sent him an email through the company and you know company email and said hey Ward I just finished my first book you got any advice and he was you know typical response you know hey keep it up you're going to get there one day you know yeah and uh, it was very vague very uh, vanilla um but I continued to foster that relationship and we became really good friends well one day he reached out to me and said hey can you get Mark Graney a backseat ride? And I was like, I don't know, I can try. And so I started, you know, asking the Navy, Hey, uh, I've got this author that's pretty talented and he's doing some research. I'd like to get him a ride in the Hornet. And, and my chain of command was super supportive of me and they, they pushed, pushed it up the chain and got it approved. So, um, from that moment on, um, Mark has been a really good asset. He's, he's read several of my books, uh, before they, you know, got published and has given me feedback of, you know, what I can do better. And, and then also I kind of, I look at what he does from a business perspective yeah. and choices he's made in his career. And I, I kind of try to, I want to model myself after what he's doing. Um, and who, who doesn't, I mean, sure. he's, he's fantastic. And he's such a nice guy. He's just so down to earth. Yeah. And just, that was the thing I noticed right off the bat is when, I flew out to Washington DC to, um, to meet up with him, to take him through the water survival training in the Navy so that he could go for a backseat ride. And, um, again, I wasn't going to talk to him about my book. I wasn't going to talk to him about my writing. This was all about getting him trained to go fly in an F-18. And one of the first things he said, so tell me about, what are you doing? Like, have you done this? Have you done that? And, uh, just so giving of his, of yeah. his, you know, time, uh, to me. So he's been, he's been really huge, um, huge supporter and a huge asset. Um, and then, uh, Connor Sullivan, I think is number two for me. Um, when, uh, I think when his first book came out, you know, there was a scene in there that involves some fighter jets and I sent him a little note on, on Twitter and, and said like, uh, you know, Hey, you should have used F-18s or something like right. that. Maybe it's some kind of smart ass comment. Yeah. And, um, and so that started a dialogue with us. And um, during my process of going out on submission and like, you know, if I had hair, I would have been pulling it out, you know, <laughs> right. stressing out. And it just so happened that I had several overnights every week where he lives and we went out for beers and he was there to keep me sane and yeah. keep me calm. And uh, so he's he's been a really big uh, supporter of, of mine. And then um, – Fellow debut author Steve Erzani is probably the third one. We also have um, John as our agent. We share the agent. And um, our books came out a week apart. Perfect Shot was a fantastic debut. And um, uh, when John 
first said, you know, with Unknown Writer, when can you, when can you be, have this done? You know, you read the two chapters. When can you finish it? And I said, you know, March. And he goes, okay. And he hung up the phone. Uh-huh. And, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what that means. So I called Steve. I'm like, Steve, I just had this strange conversation with John. And he goes, let me guess. You don't know whether he is representing you. And I'm like, yeah, I have no idea. And he goes, call him back and ask. Yeah. So the similar thing happened with Steve. Funny. And so, um, so Steve's been there from, you know, when I signed with John to, you know, going through the whole submission process yeah. now, you know, now that we're debut authors together. And, um, so we're, we're always talking and, and just kind of sharing, um, stories, but I honestly, I've met so many guys that I consider my friends. Yeah. Um, and that's one of my favorite things. Like when I walk into a bookstore now, like every, every airport I fly into, I go to, I get off the plane, I go walk around, I go into the bookstore. Sure. And uh, it's so cool seeing my friends there, you know? It's like, oh, there's Mark, and there's Don, and there's Taylor, you know, and there's Simon. And it's just, you know, it's just a really cool community to be a part of. Didn't just this morning you went into, yeah. wasn't it Love Field? You yeah. Went, and yeah. I'm trying to remember the book that I saw. Yeah, Dempsey. Dempsey, yeah. Yeah, yeah because. <laughs> Andrews Wilson. You know, I haven't seen any of their books in the, yeah. you know, in the bookstores and the airports before. So whenever I see one, you know, an author that, I haven't seen before. I take a picture and you yeah. know, post it so that they can see it. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. For my listeners who think it's some kind of a cliche, it really isn't when we say it's such a cool feeling to be in such a warm and receptive and encouraging mm-hmm. community as yeah. this. All right, we are ready to wrap it up with just two more things. Now, I haven't done rapid fire questions in a while. Yeah. And I thought nobody better than Jack Stewart, everybody. These Boy. these are such layups. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go fast on you. All right. One long hand or keyboard, uh, keyboard, fish tacos or barbecue ribs, fish tacos, <laughs> football or baseball, baseball, beer or whiskey. Oh, that one hung me up. Can I take both? Okay. Whiskey. Okay. Wow. Camping in the woods or chilling on the beach, camping in the woods. Okay, here's on the spot. The best book you've read lately? The best book I've read Just one read that pops lately? in you. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with Perfect Shot, Steve Rosani. Okay. What's the one book you've been meaning to read but just haven't been able to find the time yet? Maybe it's on your nightstand, it's on your TBR, whatever it is. What? Mm. Um, I honestly haven't read Taylor Moore's new one, Ricochet. I really want to. Oh, so good. Yeah. The first two are fantastic. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Okay. Sorry, Taylor. No worries. And last, when you're either taking a road trip or writing a book, uh, what's either the genre or the band or an artist that you like to listen to? Maybe it's for inspiration. Maybe it's in the background just to drown out the kids who are out by the pool. What is it? Uh, the one I always go back to is Grateful Dead. Oh, Deadhead. Okay. All right. And then, the, of course, the final last question, the best piece of writing advice you'd give my audience? especially from up and coming writers put in the reps, you know, don't, don't wait till you have the perfect story to start putting words on pages and just start writing. What's that quote? Hold on a second. Perfect is the enemy of good. It sounds about right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you the number of times I started writing books and got like 10 pages into it and then just stopped because I didn't have a fully thought out story, but those 10 pages were the best 10 pages I could do at that time and just continue growing from it. Yeah. Did you ever, uh, side note, did you ever set aside 10 that you're like, oh, that's pretty good, stick it aside in a book and come back years later and go, maybe I should pick this back up? Or did you feel like you that was an um, exercise at that moment? Yeah, they were all exercises. Yeah. All the books that I finished that I got to the end, I've kept, even if I haven't published mm-hmm. them. Uh, some of them I've picked clean of good scenes for yeah. other books. And this is the other thing. I, I would say um, I'd wanted to write a book just start to finish for as long as I can remember. And um, the minute I finished that first one, I realized, oh, I can actually do this. Because, you know, before you finish it, it's like this daunting thing. Yeah. It's like, like, oh, one day I'll write a book. I hear that so often. A lot of guys I fly with, I hear it all the time. Like, oh, I thought one day I'll write a book. Why not now? Right. You know, just finish it. And once you finish it, it's not that daunting anymore, you know? Yeah. Well, folks, the book, again, is Unknown Writer. It's Jack Stewart. And if you want to learn more, go to jackstewartbooks.com. And, of course, you can follow him on all the cool, hip social platforms, as I do. 
and you'll have fun. Jack, thanks so much for, thanks for having me. Making the flight all the way from Dallas. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Thanks again, Jack, for taking the time to fly out and sit down with me face to face, something I'll be doing a lot more of in the new year. Now, let me tell you about next week's guest, another debut author and rising star, Steve Yerzani. Steve's breakout thriller is called Perfect Shot, and I have to admit, it is a nonstop thrill ride that hits center mass and promises to be a smash hit. That's next week on The Thriller Zone. One more thing before I go, and it's something I need to remember to say more often because I'm finding new fans who are discovering this podcast every week. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Thriller Zone. As many of you already know, you can find us pretty much on every single podcast channel and, of course, on our website, thethrillerzone.com. Now, as we enter December and celebrate the holidays for many, I want to remind you that my wife Tammy and I will be celebrating our annual year-end extravaganza. The date is Friday, December 29th, and it promises to be chock full of plenty of fun. Then we're going to take the holidays off for a few weeks while we prepare for a brand new year with some brand new tweaks to our already successful podcast. I hope you'll join us. So until next time, I'm David Temple, your host, and I'll see you soon for another edition of The Thriller Zone.